Hi, I'm Mark Thorsby, and this is our Phenomenology video series. In this video, we'll be taking a look at Chapter 2 of Husserl's book, Ideas Pertaining to a Pure Phenomenology and to a Phenomenological Philosophy, first book. We'll be looking at Part 1, uh, Chapter 2, and then Part 2, Chapter 1 in the next video. So, welcome aboard. It's good to have you back. I hope you've been enjoying the video series um, in Phenomenology. Um, last time... Uh, we've been looking here at Husserl's Ideas One book, which is to sort of throw it out here. Here's what it, here's what it looks like, the paperback edition. Um, and we last time we looked at chapter one of the first part of this book, and really that sort of section was really meant to lay out some of the conceptual groundwork regarding what phenomenology consists in. Um, and also to dispel certain sorts of um, problems and mistakes that we may have in the way in which we conceive and understand phenomenology. We're going to see in chapter 2 of Husserl's book here, um, is we're going to see him attack directly um, some of the theses related to naturalism as well as empiricism. And some of the empiricist or empirical sorts of objections you can imagine a phenomenologist having. Now, keep in mind here that a phenomenology can be understood, again, as uh, the science which analyzes the necessary conditions which make our experience of phenomena possible as they are in our experience. Um, at least that's how I would define it. It's the study of phenomena in a transcendental sense. Um, not unlike sort of Kantian vernacular. So we talked about this. Take a look at the introduction to phenomenology that I have posted again if you want more clarity on that. So let me sort of jump in here. So in, cha Whoa, what happened? So in chapter two, uh, the name of this chapter is called Naturalistic Misinterpretation, Misinterpretations. And fundamentally what Husserl is concerned with in doing in this chapter is first and from the outset, <clears throat> um, defending what he conceives of phenomenology against certain sorts of misinterpretations that might um, uh, come from a more naturalistic or empirical perspective. Remember, empiricism refers to the idea, to the epistemological framework or to the theory of knowledge, that our knowledge comes from our experience. Um, and naturalism, as we described in an earlier video, uh, refers to the idea that ultimately um, everything is rooted in the natural physical sciences and that ultimately phenomenology are the phenomena that we experience can be explained accordingly. Now, Edmund Husserl is going to immediately attack this and really argue that this is a complete misinterpretation of the problem. And so that's sort of what this chapter is about. Whoop, let me go here and let's see if we can. So let's take a look here at this first one. And again, we're following through with the section titles that Husserl actually uses in Ideas 1. So in section 18, for instance, uh, the title is Introduction to Critical Discussions. And what Husserl wants to do in this is basically lay out some of the basic issues, right? So the first sort of thing he sort of talks about is the idea that universal statements about essence and the science of essence present in advance the essential foundations for the idea of pure phenomenology. Now, in this first uh, first two chapters of Husserl's work, he doesn't really do phenomenology so much as lay out some of the conceptual groundwork. In many ways, I almost think of Husserl here as uh, sort of uh, doing the preparation sorts of work, right? But it's important though that when we make universal statements about essence, when I say that, for instance, all triangles have three sides, right? Um, that's a universal statement about essence. And the science of essence is about understanding the universal correlates of these sorts of essences, right? In, in advance, this sort of question of making universal claims about our ideas, right, gives us a window into understanding what phenomenology is interested in and what some of the essential foundations are, right? Husserl admits that there is a problem regarding the clarity of language here, uh, that we can easily become sort of um, confused by the language we employ to talk about our experience of things as well as um, what we mean when we talk about essences and ideas. And here, of course, Husserl is well aware that our philosophical history has given us 
a whole vernacular of, con of philosophical conceptions that may or may not be uh, well placed for doing a phenomenology, right? Uh, one of the things we can mention is that the aforesaid gives us a difference. The aforesaid gives us differences in pure intuition. So when and we're going to see here that Aristotle, not Aristotle, Husserl's conception of intuition here is not totally different from that that Immanuel Kant also would employ, right? Intuition, as far as I can conceive of it, is fundamentally referring to the transcendental capacities that we have for understanding things, right? So for instance, but, but think about it even more in a more visceral sense, right? If I say that all triangles have three sides, right? Um, that's in, and let's compare, for instance, that statement with another statement. Let's say, for instance, this triangle is pink, right? These two statements reveal different differences in terms of the intuition that I have uh, or the capacity I have in terms of understanding something, right? And it looks like something is going on that's quite peculiar and important, right? Because it looks like we do have some sort of universal knowledge or a uh, we have some sort of universal purchase on ideas. And this signals for us that there must be differing forms or differing types of capacities possible in consciousness. So the sort of difference here signifies a difference in pure intuition, right? Let me get this there. There we go. Now, this is where this, um, I put this passage in here. And this is from 33. Again, I'm using the side uh, pagination, the Husserliana pagination here, um, where Husserl says, quote, the philosophical epoche, and this is the, the Greek term that Husserl uses, and it's just epoch or epoche is the way you'd pronounce this. The philosophical epoche that we are undertaking shall consist of our completely abstaining from any judgment regarding the doctrinal content of any previous philosophy and affecting all of our demonstrations within the limits set by this abstention, right? So Husserl sort of, what, you're going to see here that this term epoch, or epoch, Husserl is going to use this term epoch to refer to something that we can do in consciousness as an investigator of consciousness. Um, and we're going to, by the end of the, um, the, not this video, but the end of the next video, we'll Husserl will articulate exactly what he means by this concept epoche, right? But what we can say is epoche is, so, is basically what we might call the philosophical attitude of exploring and investigating the essences of um, the conceptual objects we have, right? Now remember, for Husserl, in the classic vernacular philosophy, we talk about the categories of essence and existence, right? Objects have existence, but existence was always seen classically as a secondary accidental category of essence. So Husserl is not going to really stick with that framework, even though I don't know if he's fully opposed to it. Um, but, well, yeah, he would be opposed to it, I think, ultimately. Um, but what, what Husserl will say is that in essence refers to the content of our ideas, right? So that's the way I understand it. Um, and so to explore the essences of things is to explore the necessary relations between the ideas that we have, and it's to explore the characteristic features of those ideas. And of course, here, the premier example for Husserl as a mathematician is mathematics, right? When I understand the number two, right, Notice that the number two can be written in different ways. Two is equal to one plus one. Two is equal to negative four plus six, for instance. Or two is also equal to eight, eight, the fraction eight over four. All of these are different ways of singling out the concept four, or the number four. Or I'm sorry, the number two, pardon me. Right? So when we have a concept of number, right, we have the there's different ways in which we can understand that concept so to understand the number two is not to understand a word it's to understand the essence of something such that we're able to recognize it in different formulations right so Husserl wants to explore these essences 
and he's going to do so through a philosophical epoch. But in order to do this philosophical epoch, the first sort of point here is that we're going to abstain from any judgment regarding the doctrine of other previous philosophers. That is, really from this point forward, as a phenomenologist or as a student in phenomenology, and while you're doing phenomenology, what we're going to do is we're going to bracket out and ignore all of the philosophical theories that we agree with or, or have learned or are familiar with. Right? And we're going to ignore and we're going to abstain from making any of the judgments that regard the sorts of doctrines that, that we've read about previously. And the only thing that we're going to look at is we're going to demonstrably analyze our consciousness. This is what the philosophical epoch is. And that is we're only going to explore the essences insofar as they themselves appear to be. Uh, we're not going to assume, we're not going to be doing a interpretive analysis, right? Um, as philosophers, a, a good example of this would be, um, right, we're all familiar with, uh, you, you, the, the, someone writes a play or writes a book, and then a Marxist philosopher reads that play or book and then understands all of it according to Marxist categories, right? The same thing would be true regarding any number of philosophical views. And what Husserl wants to say is, this isn't what we're doing here. As we explore the science of essences, we're going to demonstrably abstain from these sorts of judgments, right? Now, Husserl says, though, that one of the things we're going to see is, even though we're going, we're not going, we're going to abstain from making any judgments in, about doctrines and philosophy as we explore consciousness and phenomenology, there is, from the very outset, a controversy with empiricism. Right, empiricism in its brute sense refers to uh, the idea that knowledge is gained through experience, typically through some sort of physical sensation. Now, empiricism, of course, for Husserl, refers to something a little bit more complex and more particular. On the one hand, he's referring to the specific empirical tradition that comes out of the British empiricists, such as John Locke and David Hume. Um, and others. And in particular, he's going to be attacking a version of empiricism that was quite popular in his own day. Um, and, um, and I think still is today, right? So there's, there's a problem and a controversy with empiricism. Well, okay, what exactly is the problem here? Now, this is section 19. The empiricist identification of experience and the originarily presentative act. Now, before we sort of go through what the general controversy is, keep in mind that the empiricist thinks that our experience is the moment or is the, I don't know, is the, um, is the touchstone by which knowledge is fundamentally generated from, right? I have to experience the world in terms of my sensation. I have a cup. I, I drink it, I taste it, I recognize it's water, right? And the idea here is that my experience, this sort of raw um, description of my sensations, that this is where uh, our knowledge originates from. And you can see they treat it as the most originary thing. It's presentative in the sense that the world presents itself to me in my experience, right? I don't determine what the, the liquid tastes like. Rather, the liquid tells me what it tastes like, as it were, right? And so what you're going to see here that Husserl is going to argue is that the empiricist has a conception of experience, but the conception of experience is not the first, most original um, and primary presentative act. It's not uh, experience as the sort of natural experience of sensation here is not at all uh, originarily presentative. So what is his argument? Well, empiricism, of course, he says, originates from praiseworthy motives, right? So I, I like this. All good philosophers butter you up before they, before they kill. And Husserl's no exception, right? He says, quote, what he likes about empiricism is that it's a radicalism of the cognitive practice that aims at enforcing the right of autonomous reason as the sole authority on questions of truth. So from Husserl's perspective, the empiricist has good motives. That is, they want to make sure that our reasons um, are at the core of what sorts of judgments we can say we have about the world. And in terms of what our questions are about truth, reason should be our guiding light. The empiricist just thinks that our reason is built from experience. 
right? And therefore, we can use our, our, our knowledge now about experience to then qualify, quantify, and understand different sorts of claims that we make in knowledge. So Husserl says, empiricists, you guys are good. Good guys, you're trying to do what's best, and it's good philosophical motives. But here's the problem. To, to judge rationally requires a first sort of principle. It requires that we conform to the things themselves. And we'll see, especially even beyond Husserl, when we get to Martin Heidegger's philosophy, that this language of the things themselves is quite important for the phenomenologist. Because one of the things we notice in our experience is that my experience is spontaneous, right? My experience is coming into existence um, in a sort of spontaneous way. I'm not controlling it, right? The, fa the features of my experience of the cup are not something that I'm creating. They're given to me in a moment-by-moment -moment basis, right? And, and the, the sort of edict of reason here, this radicalism that he thinks that the empiricist conforms to, all, while on the one hand it originates from praiseworthy motives, on the other hand, it mistakes uh, it mistakes the principle, right? The principle he thinks is not that we have to um, that our knowledge has to ultimately be verified by our experiences, right? Or that our experiences guide what exactly we can say can be known, but rather that to judge something rationally means that our judgments conform to the way things are, right? Um, so, for instance, if I say, I mean, this is not Husserl's example by a long shot, but if I say there's a red cup on the table, that judgment, if that judgment is to be counted as true, because remember we're talking about the authority on questions of truth, if I'm going to say that judgment is true, then lo and behold, I better have a red cup here. Um, and if I don't have a red cup, then my judgments are not in conformity with the things themselves. Now, this will be important because this means what exactly? It means that the that we are philosophically required to make judgments that are in conformity with the way things are, right? But the way things are is not necessarily derived purely through empirical observation, right? Empiricism assumes really that genuine science and the experimental sciences are identical. That is, the empiricist treats physical experimental science as the only type of real science, right? Um, so and this is common, right, in philosophy. I teach a lot of philosophy classes, and it's not uncommon that when we ask someone, uh, you know, what they think about taking a philosophy class, my students will say, well, it's all interesting, but, you know, I prefer a real science class, or I prefer a class that gives you real knowledge. And what they're signaling is that they have a prejudice, should I say, or they have a certain um, perspective that values uh, the experimental sciences, the empirical sciences, as really the only genuine, authentic forms of science. And Husserl finds this is very, very problematic uh, because ultimately this means that mathematics can't fit into the category because mathematics, after all, is not an empirical discipline, at least not in Husserl's perspective, right? Uh, so let's sort of go here. So what's the empiricist argument? Well, the empiricist argument is that our experience gives us an actuality, right? So I experienced the red cup, so that means the red cup is actually there. Um, and that's what, so then if we're going to conform our reasons to the things themselves, the empiricist says, well, you have to conform to the actualities given to you in experience, right? And that would mean from the empiricist perspective, things that I can imagine are not actual. They're not real. Now, in a certain way, the things that I can imagine, like, for instance, I can close my eyes and imagine, um, um, you know, a big dragon, a big green dragon. But when I close my eyes and imagine that, the, the, what I'm imagining is real insofar as it's a modification of my consciousness, but it's not real in terms of anything outside of my consciousness, right? Um, it's purely fictitious. So to study types of imagination from the empiricist perspective is to study not things that are not real, but to study irreality. Something is irreal in this case, right? So the empiricist treats experience as the only thing that really counts as actual, and it treats other types of cognition as irreal fundamentally. So thus, a science of imaginations, 
And he and here, of course, he thinks this is what the empiricist thinks about the phenomenologist, is they just imagine a whole bunch of stuff and think that they can come up with demonstrably verifiable scientific claims by doing that. Um, and he says, yeah, from the from the empiricist standpoint, this looks like ideological excess or a return to scholasticism. Now, scholasticism refers to the ancient medieval tradition in which um, essentially philosophers would would just uh, they they didn't really have original sorts of investigation, but just taught previous philosophers' ideas, and then slowly would talk about intricacies within them. But there was never any fundamentally new work being done in philosophy. It was all derivative of something else. That is, all that all that philosophy was was a type of scholarship, right? A scholarship that reached back in the Middle Ages, ultimately to uh, an Aristotelian tradition in the High Middle Ages and to a certain theological framework, right? So this class he says, listen, the empiricist looks at the phenomenology and says, you know, you're just doing some crazy type of scholasticism. You're going, you're out, it's out of control. It's an excess of sorts. Now, so what's the problem from Husserl's perspective? Well, empiricism, he thinks, involves a misunderstanding or a prejudice, right? Um, and, and I sort of highlighted the term prejudice here, but by all he means by prejudice is that we value something more than another uh, or this we're misunderstanding we don't really know what we're valuing so he says there's really it looks like from his perspective two things that are being confused two demands that get confused in the prejudice of empiricism so the first demand here is the fundamental demand for that conformity to the things themselves we've already mentioned that Right, so there's a fundamental demand that something can only be true if it conforms to to the way things really are. Otherwise, you don't have a you don't have a way of differentiating what's false in terms of what's real in the world versus what's only real in the mind. Right, um, but there's another demand that the the empiricist recognizes, and that's the demand that uh, the demand for the legitimation of cognition by experience. So. The empiricists, on the one hand, recognize you have to conform to the way things are. But on the other hand, they think they argue and they they think and they presume that the the only sorts of cognition that's legitimate, the only sort of mental operations that should really count, are those which can be legitimated by experience in some manner or another. Right. Um, so the question is, which of these demands is more fundamental? Which of them should we prejudice, right? So in a certain way, it's not the idea that it, every, we, there are no prejudices. The question is, which of these should, be pre, should we prejudice over the other? Which of them is more fundamental? In fact, some empiricists, I don't think, even recognize that there is a difference in these two demands. And by the way, that's whose role's point as well. Well, Husserl says this. He thinks that the genuine freedom from prejudice, right, uh, only demands a rejection of the judgments made that are alien to experience when the proper sense of the judgment demands their legitimation by experience. Essentially what he's arguing here is that um, we only have to be worried about those judgments. There are some judgments which require experience to verify, but not all. And so that means that this second demand, right, the demand for legitimation by cognition of experience, this demand only counts for a certain category or subcategory of potential judgments and propositions made, right? Um, so for instance, and he, of course he's going to be thinking about mathematics here, right? So when I say all triangles have three sides, like take that as your example, right? I think we can all agree that all triangles have three sides. Right, uh, but you can see here that in order to know that's true, we don't need experience to verify it. Right, I don't have to go look at different triangles to make sure that that claim is true. Right, um, and so you can see here that, uh, but there, but I do need to make sure that my claim that all all triangles have three sides is in conformity with the thingly nature of triangles. Now, of course, it's the definition of triangles. That is, it's a description of the essence of triangleness. And so in that sense, it's obvious that, that I can say all triangles have three sides does meet this demand to conform to the things themselves, but it doesn't meet this demand, right? And his point here is that we don't only need to apply this prejudicial demand of experience to certain things, things like um, there's a coffee cup in my office, 
boom, verified, right? You can sort of see that there are certain claims that require that, but not necessarily all. The problem with empiricism is empiricism reduces these demands into one, um, and that creates a confused state of things, right? And what Husserl argues is that what we what we do in phenomenology is we we have a sort of immediate seeing. In fact, he says, and so does the empiricists too. They have also a form of immediate seeing. Now he says immediate seeing, not merely sensuous experiential seeing, right? So he's meaning seeing in terms of a different thing. He's thinking of the way in which we can cognize or understand things, right? But my understanding isn't dependent on my eyes, right? So to see something cognitively, to understand it, doesn't require eyeballs. Right, but seeing in the universal sense as an originarily presentative consciousness of any kind, whatever, is the ultimate legitimating source of all rational assertions. So his argument is basically this: is that whenever we make a rational assertion, when I say something is the case, right, I make a claim of some sort, whether or not that claim is considered true or not has to fall in conformity where it's possible for me to cognitively see it um, in its most original and presentative form of consciousness. And if I can do that, then it's it can be legitimated, right? So when I say all triangles have three sides, or if I say all bodies have extension, right? These sorts of claims, cognitive claims, we understand they're true through a sort of cognitive seeing in which we recognize that the definition I'm giving, right, a triangle has three sides, right, the three-sidedness part, that that is immediately in, origina in an original way presents the essence of what a triangle is in a complete manner. And if I can recognize that, check, I've recognized something that falls in within that first category of the demand of conforming to the things themselves. I hope this makes sense, but you're going to see that ultimately what phenomenologists do is they're exploring this form of immediate seeing in terms of what sorts of intuitional capacities we have, and also in terms of um, what is not what is and is not possible for consciousness in these types of modalities. Now, number 20 is empiricism and skepticism. You should be well familiar, if you've taken philosophy before, of the idea that there that empiricism has been has been used um, to offer a whole range of skeptical um, skeptical arguments, right? So empiricism can become a sort of skepticism in which you don't you're not sure if you can make a judgment or something, right? But but here's the thing: it's for in phenomenology, instead of using experience as this primary originative category for seeing things we're going to use a different category and this is this category of intuition right and so the idea here is that um, at the end of the day what we're not looking for in phenomenology is an experience to verify our claims or our judgments what we're looking for is an intu a, a demonstration of our intuitive and capacities a demonstration of intuition itself. Um, and if we can do that, then that will function as a legitimating source for specific judgments we can make about consciousness. Think about, for instance, when I talked about intentionality some weeks ago, and we'll talk more about intentionality in, in subsequent videos as Husserl begins to identify the subject. But um, in intentionality, we said intentionality is the directedness of consciousness. It's the idea that your consciousness is always directed at one thing and then it shifts about but your consciousness is never about all things or nothing. Your consciousness is directional, right? Now, how can that be true? I can't experience the directionality of consciousness. It's because I, I can only experience objects in my field of perception. But my, I only experience those objects according to the mode of the intention, the directedness. So you can see here that how does it's intuitively obvious that our consciousness has a directionality. But you can't prove it by pointing to something in experience because it's the it's that by which you do experience, right? How do you recognize it? Well, you recognize it intuitively, right? You recognize that your intuition is such and so that this is the case, right? So from Husserl's perspective, by contesting the validity of eidetic thinking, right? And eidetic thinking is the, is the way we, in which Husserl wants to think about essences, 
and analyze these essences in consciousness, right? The empiricist denies that, but he says by doing this, the empiricist creates demands that are ultimately contradictory, that ultimately contradict, right? So, for example, an empir what would an empiricist defense of universal judgments look like, right? Um, the empiricist would argue that in order for something to be a true judgment, that judgment must be in conformity with experience, right? And that that is a universal judgment. And that, I'm sorry, pardon me. And that for the empiricist, making, for the empiricist, uh, the criteria of experience is a universal criteria, right? The empiricist makes the universal judgment that all knowledge must derive from experience. But how can empiricists defend that? Because if it's true that all knowledge derives from experience, then how do you gain knowledge that um, empirically that all knowledge has to come from experience? There is no experience of the universality of making empirical judgments, as it were, right? So what does this mean is that the empiricist, on the one hand, requires something like a universal judgment, but universal judgments are not something that can be empirically verified, right? You can't go into the world to make sure, you can't go into the world to make sure that um, certain logical laws are the same, right? Think about in mathematics, we say in ordinary arithmetic, three plus two equals five, right? And it can only equal five under the ordinary rules of arithmetic, right? And the empiricist, I'm sorry, the, the, how could an empiricist defend that, right? You don't go into the world looking for the universality of a judgment, right? Why? Because number one, it's impossible. Number two, what would you look for, right? And so there are, the problem here is that the empiricist has a, cri a universal criteria that can't be verified empirically. So empiricism rests upon something that is not from empiricism, but but yet empiricism denies anything that goes outside of that which is empirical. So that means that you end up with a sort of contradiction, right? And like for another example, Husserl gives us, what about the distinction between deduction and induction, right? If, you, if you've taken logic or you've seen one of my logic videos, then you'll know that uh, deduction refers to argumentation by necessity. Induction refers to argumentation or reasoning by probability. Well, are, is that difference, is that distinction something that can be verified by experience, by an empirical truth, as it were? And the obvious answer is no, it can't, right? Uh, you can't verify that, right? And you can see here, but this is problematic because the empiricist depends upon certain types of inductions and deductions, and it depends upon that difference. Um, and when I was reading this, I thought this was a quite beautiful passage. I don't know if you'll agree now, uh, or I don't know if I'll agree now, but uh, Husserl says something in this passage, which is quite, I find it quite inspiring and quite beautiful. He says, if positive is tantamount to an absolute unprejudiced grounding of all sciences on the positive, that is to say, on what can be seized upon the originator, then we are in the, we are the genuine positivists. Now, positivism, just to sort of give you a background knowledge here, positive re refers to a very specific type of theory regarding logic um, and regarding um, um, epistemology that origin that was in that was was quite popular when Air, when Husserl was alive. Today, there's not many positivists left, though there are some. Um, and the idea of positivism is we can make positive assertions about the way the world is insofar as we can verify those statements. And so he's not a positive by a long shot. And so he's sort of shooting uh, cannon uh, fodder off the bow of his ship here. But he's saying, I'm a, we're positive as if, what you mean by positivism, is that we seize upon original forms of intuition in a, in a positive sense. So he'd say, okay, in one way we're positivist, right? But in fact... We allow no authority to curtail our right to accept all kinds of intuition, equally valuable, legitimating sources of cognition, not even the authority of modern natural science. So Husserl here falls within this great tradition in philosophy of basically bucking the trend and basically saying no, one's go no one can tell us what counts in terms of genuine intuition. Right. 
uh, the positivist, that is the school of philosophers who call themselves positivists, they can't tell us that the only sorts of intuition that counts is the intuition that you get from your eyeballs and your sense experience. There are other forms of intuition, right? And he says, he goes on, when it is natural, when it is actually natural science that speaks, we then gladly listen as disciples. But it is not always natural science that speaks when the natural scientists are speaking, and it assuredly is not when it is not when we, when they are talking about the philosophy of nature and epistemology as natural science. And above all, it is not natural science that speaks when they try to make us believe. That the general truisms, such as all such that all axioms express, are indeed expression of experiential matters of fact. Right. So he wants to basically say this: is the natural scientist has the right to make claims about natural science, and in those cases we listen and learn. But the problem is the natural scientist also picks up and frequently takes on certain epistemological and indeed metaphysical ontological assumptions about the world right that are that are not uh, within the category of natural scientists right so the natural scientist's job is to experiment on the world do observations and then try to you know uh, make hypotheses and falsify and verify them accordingly right and that's great within the purview of that science that scientific limit the, the limit of the discipline itself in the physics, for instance. Um, his argument here, though, is, but when the naturalist says that when, the nat when, the, when we take natural science and we extend it even further to say that all and only claims of an experiential or empirical nature can count as legitimate, we're no longer doing natural science. We're now doing a sort of um, philosophy uh, that's only half baked. It hasn't really explored or understood these, right? So Husserl wants us to un unhook some of these prejudices. Now, Husserl sort of disagrees with empiricism on the one hand, but on the other hand, he's also quite clear that in the historic the historical um, framework has been that you have rationalist and empiricist, and you also have idealist. Um, and you can think here of people like Immanuel Kant. He says, but if you go to idealism in this sort of philosophical sense that uh, we typically refer to when we use the term, uh, there's lots of problems and there's lots of accusations. The big one on the table is obscurity. And this is the idea that the idealist is talking about intuition and understanding your perceptions in terms of your capacities and all this sort of stuff. And the empiricist might just simply say, that's so obscure. What exactly are you talking about? Because if you're not talking about something that's outside of you that we can all see, then that means you're talking about something that's only subjectively constituted. If it's subjectively constituted, how can we um, differentiate uh, the aspects and characteristics of consciousness in a precise and in a clear manner? And so the idealist here, the person who argues that ideas or essences are real, and have a reality that we can explore scientifically, like Husserl, right? The idea here is that this is just too obscure, right? And what this might even mean is that because of this obscurity, philosophically, idealism seems and potentially there's a suspicion that it allows for an emotional coloring of our ju judgments, right? That is, we can let our own predispositions and our own biases creep into our analyses. And this is what he calls the mystic index very, right? Now, uh, oops, let me go back here. So what is Husserl's argument about this? Well, he thinks this, this whole argument is erroneous, erroneous. Why? Because if we can understand eidetic seeing, uh, because what eidetic seeing is, it is it isolates our intuition of the essences of concepts, and importantly, it also isolates the ways in which our concepts cannot be intuited, right? And what we do is, if we can slowly trace together the relationships between what he calls affair complexes, right? That is, we can deduce like intricate relations of intuitional capacity, then he thinks that, that this avoids the problem of obscurity, right? Is that we aren't going to be led down some um, emotional coloring 
of our um, object, of our investigation, or of our philosophy, so long as by we're very careful, systematic, and clear in terms of identifying the sorts of relationships we can describe in consciousness. This is what the affair complex is. Now, doesn't this mean that it almost sounds like Husserl is advocating a position regarding uh, that sounds platonic and sounds like a sort of platonic realism, right? And the name of this chapter, of course, is The Essence and Concept, right? Is this a platonic realism, right? Now, what is platonic realism? Recall that Plato argued that the, all of our perceptions of objects depend upon their participation in transcendental ideal things, ideas, that he called forms, right, or idos, right? And that what's real ultimately is not the physical thing we're experiencing, but the most real thing are the objects themselves. And so from Plato's perspective, when, to understand the essence of a triangle is to actually understand something that really does exist outside of me. It exists in this realm of the forms, right? Um, and so is, and here's the worry that Husserl wants to sort of address, um, is Husserl advocating a type of Platonic philosophy here, in which you have these real these essences that the phenomenology is trying to uncover, right? Well, what does he argue? He says, well, if object, if by object and something real, actuality and real actually have one in the same sense, then the conceptions of ideas as objects and actualities is indeed a perverse Platonic hypostasization, right? Sort of very technical term there, right? He says the truth is that all oops, pardon the uh, spelling error. The truth is that all human beings see ideas, essences. We all see them, and we see them, so to speak, continuously. We operate them with the, with our thinking. They also make humans also make eidetic judgments, except that from their from their epistemological standpoint, they interpret them away, right? So his idea here is that well, first and foremost. There is something real going on when we think about ideas because all the time we're using these ideas to think about things and to understand and to cognize our world. So, for instance, when I walk in my office, I look behind me and I see a bookshelf, right? And I have an idea of what a bookshelf is, right? And it's not just the physical experience. Like, so, for instance, when I'm walking to class, I'm thinking about, oh, I need to take the attendance. Oh, I need to prepare um, a couple questions for the discussion, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things I'm referring to, the questions, the discussion, the attendance, all of those things are just ideas. And somehow I'm relating them together in a certain sort of way. And he wants to say that what he's calling this thing in our mind is an object. It's an essence. It's an object. Uh, but it's not the same thing as saying that something is real in the sort of substantial sense. There is a reality to it, but it's not the same. And if we did try to say that those were identical, to say that the objects that we employ in consciousness are real actualities in the way that, um, in the way that we seem to have an intuitive capacity to recognize in terms of our objects and our experience, then that would be to commit a sort of uh, platonic like move within the thing. And he doesn't want to be a Plato, right? Uh, he doesn't want to just sort of redo Plato's philosophy in more systematic terms, right? One of the things he says is that universal scientific language and logic essentially find the category of the universal indispensable, right? Uh, and that's one of the things that's important here is that to talk about an essence is to talk about something that's universal, right? Because they take the idea or the essence of a couch, Right. What is a couch? Well, um, you notice here that uh, whatever whatever definition I give to the to the term couch, that definition should be universal in the sense that all of the objects in my experience, this couch, this couch and this couch, all of these specific objects all fit my essential conception. Right. You can see here that means that in order to make to even use terms, I need this category of the universal. And so scientific language and logic necessarily presuppose this um, as a precondition um, for science itself. Oops. Okay. So he says, now some people would say, well, wait, aren't ideas and concepts, aren't they really just mental constructs, right? Um, 
he said, Husserl says, uh, they are dangerous because of their metaphysical suggestions. That is, Husserl argues that some people think that all of our ideas are just made up. We just, they're somehow mental constructs. Because I can make a mental construct, right? Think, for example, if I take the word lion and I, th and I say, you have a polka dot lion, a lion with polka dots all over it, right? Now, that's a mental construct. As far as I know, there's no such thing as a polka dotted lion. Right. And what I've done is I've constructed an idea. Right. And one objection to Husserl would say, listen, maybe all of these ideas that you think are universal are just mental constructs. And because they're mental constructs, it's a mistake to then think that there's some sort of ontology or there's some sort of uh, relation to the way things really are that we that can be generated out of this discussion. Here, for instance, think about Wittgenstein, right? Uh, where the later Wittgenstein argues that philosophy is really just a set of non-problems, right? The later Wittgenstein argues that um, in language, we our language has its meaning insofar as there's specific um, living practices that accompany those words and that language, right? So, for instance, the word cup, for Wittgenstein, the word cup has its meaning in a language practice. And when you use the term cup and you pick up objects like this, you call them cup and so on and so forth, right? But Wittgenstein's point is that what can happen, though, is that philosophers let, we let our words run away with us and we start to treat the words, the ideas, as something that's alien or separate from the practice of language itself. And so, and Wittgenstein argues that this creates a whole degree of metaphysical problems. Think, for instance, about the language of freedom, right? The word freedom has lots of different connotations and lots of different senses that we can understand when we're talking about specific practices. But when the philosopher asks, are we free? Or are we determined? What this philosopher does is they ultimately take um, a, a, an idea from Wittgenstein's perspective, they take a use of language and then they sort of throw it into the metaphysical and they try to create a metaphysical theory. Uh, but the problem is by taking it out of the traditional practice or not traditional, but out of the life, the uh, living practice, a word loses its meaning because it's derivative from that practice. So Wittgenstein then says that most of the philosophy problems that we have today are not actually problems in philosophy, right? They're just misunderstandings. They're different variations of nonsense. Now, Husserl doesn't think this, and he wants to counter this, right? And he says, for instance, well, think about, for instance, cardinal numbers. And if you're not familiar with cardinal numbers, a cardinal number is the number that signifies um, different sets within a set theory. Um, and I'm not going to go through it, but just to give you sort of an example here, um, set theory is the idea that there's different sizes, different shapes, different forms of infinity. So for instance, this is the famous diagonal proof, an example of it, which for instance, you can imagine, take any sequence or pattern. So this one's true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. And take another sequence pattern, false, true, false, true, false, true, or another one, false, 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 true, false, true, false, 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 true, false, true, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This one would be true, 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 true. It's just true forever. This one's false, 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 and false. Now notice that these can go on in forever. The pattern can go on infinitely. Right? But notice that this infinity is different from the infinity that's con that's represented in line two, and it's different from the infinity in line three. And in fact, you can always create a new infinity by going with the diagonals of any any um, combinational sequence, right? Um, and this sort of reveals that there's different types of infinity. Now, take a look at my logical. Uh, philosophical logic video to, to, which talks about this in more depth, right? But what is a cardinal number? Well, a cardinal number for him is not a mental construct. Now, it's true that that we do we did discover and name the term cardinal number, but the property is external to us, right? The property that's revealed by a cardinal number is not something that's manufactured because it's not the result of my spontaneous imagination. It's the result of certain necessary features regarding numeration itself. 
right? So Husserl says, certainly I frame my numbers. I, I form my numerical objectivations in adding one plus one, right? Where the numerical objectivation is not the number itself. It's not the number two, his single member of the numerical series, which, all, which like all members, is an atemporal being, right? The idea here is that numbers... Um, have a certain sort of objective reality um, and we're not it's not just the word that we're letting our our um, our language run away with us it's because there's it has to be like this from Husserl's perspective right how else could we understand what exactly we're doing when we count and do things like this right so the next section 23 the spontaneity of ideation now I've used this term spontaneity a little bit and essence and victim right <clears throat> So Husserl says here that, uh, but don't we, we do construct some concepts, right? Like, for instance, the concept of red, the concept of house, the concept of senator, right? Um, yes, it, yes, that is constructed both as an Im imagination or an imaging and something spontaneous. And yes, it's true that, like, my concept of a senator is apart from the mental process itself. But the process of imagination, of imagining, is not in itself something spontaneous. Um, uh, pardon me. It's not something in itself spontaneous and imagined itself, right? I'm not imagining a cardinal number, as it were, right? But what about the existence of an essence? What does it mean to say that something, that an essence, that a conceptual object has existence? Because clearly if it has existence, has a different type of existence or some sort of primary form of existence, right? And here, for example, let's take this. Um, events cause us to have memories, right? The event is the actual occurrence, and the memory is the actual remembering of something. Now, in his argument here is that an essence is like a memory, right? The actuality of the essence can be intended correctly, at times falsely, like geometry, right? So think about the geometer. The person who's doing geometry is looking at parallel lines or something, right? And sometimes a person can make a mistake in geometry, and sometimes they do the parallel proofs correctly, right? Hopefully correctly, right? And his idea then is that what seems to happen is that we, that it's like memories. When we talk about essences, we're talking about the way in which Think their memory like objects relate to each other in consciousness. So when we talk about spontaneity, this is sort of code for the 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 givenness of our immediate experience. And ideation refers to the is sort of code for the the mental structure of ideas. And the idea here is that these two things are derivative and separate, right? And here we can think about essence and fictum, right? What the essence of something is and what's fictional, right? Um, so let's move here to next, right? And so this leads us to 24, which is a very important point. It's called, he calls it the principle of all principles. And it's quite simple. The principle of all principles is that every originary presentative intuition is a legitimating source of cognition. That is, that everything originarily offered to us in intuition is to be accepted simply as what it is presented as being, but also only within the limits in which it is presented here. And so here's the idea, is that when we analyze the sorts of cognitions we have when we, when we do, when we explore the essences of ideas, right, and what the phenomenologist is uncovering, is they're not discovering facts about the world, right? It's not about facts, they're discovering the essence of the ideas uh, that are related to the concepts by which we experience the world, right? And the principle of all principles is that at the end of the day, what makes something um, valid in cognition is whether or not it's offered to us in its most primary and original form of intuition. Now, he does say that even though we're going to accept, like, for instance, take intentionality, the directedness of consciousness, right? This is something that's, that's originarily presentative to me, right? Uh, but I have to accept it only for what it is. I have to accept it as a form of intuition, right? I don't accept it um, or understand it as some sort of feature about the world outside of my, my cognition itself, right? Uh, so we use this principle of principle. Now, in practice, 
the positivist has scientific investigator nature, right? But there, is, but there is a problem in practice, right? Because aren't there a virtual infinity of experiences possible, right? So here's what Husserl is suggesting. He's saying, listen, when we do, uh, when we explore these features of consciousness, right, we can also recognize that there, when, when I do have an imagination, there is an original presentative um, a, a part of that which is there's this part of my cognition, even when I imagine things that aren't real, that does give me some sort of original presentative information. That is, I, I can comprehend my imagination as an imagining, right? But doesn't this, there's a million, a infinity of experiences that are possible. Doesn't that also mean that there's an infinity of judgments possible, which clearly is problematic? Well, here's what Husserl argues on page 45. <clears throat> he says, we take the most correct course by referring to the sense proper of mathematical assertions. So, in order to know without doubt what a mathematical axiom states, we have to turn not to empiricist philosophers, but rather to that consciousness in which, in full insight, we make, mathemat we make mathematizingly uh, seize upon axiomatic, predicatively formed, a fair complexes, right? And so the idea here is that in consciousness, when I recognize a, a mathematical axiom, that moment in consciousness, right, is is revealing a certain a fair complex of certain relations within consciousness itself, and we can we can refer to those in that sense and be fine with it, right? Okay. So, uh, and he has this other great quote, right? It may be that we've inherited cognitive dispositions from cognitions of past generations, but the histories of these heritage heritages are as indifferent to us as the history of gold is for the value of gold. Now, this is a sort of side comment that I put in here because I think it's quite um, pithy. And this is where Husserl basically says, yeah, there's other philosophers who've done a lot of work before us, and there's certain cognitive dispositions and certain things that they've figured out, which are great. But guess what? For us, that is as indifferent as the history of gold is to the current price value of gold. In the same way, the history of our cognitions are as indifferent to us um, in the same manner, right? We don't care about the history of our cognitions. We care about the value of our cognitions insofar as they are valuable right now for us in the immediate spontaneous forms of intuitive experience we have, right? So what does this mean at the end of the day? Well, this, it means that there's a sort of science that we, can, that we need to avoid a certain type of dogmatic attitude. And here Husserl, oh, another spelling error. I've seen a couple in this video, so my apologies. Uh, Husserl then differentiates and says there's sorts of different attitudes that the philosopher can have, right? The natural material sciences have taken a grand step forward in advancing knowledge, but they've also taken a half step backwards in adopting this reductive skeptical attitude that says that all knowledge can only already be empirical. If that's the case, you end up with all kinds of problems, most importantly, which is the sort of self-contradiction that gets created when uh, you re realize that the empirical natural sciences depend upon the laws of logic to make their assertions and their claims. But their assertions and claims seem to deny uh, the validity of logic outside of them. And you can't verify logical validity using experience, right? Um, and so this is all, so the natural sciences have taken us forward, but they've also taken us backwards, right? He says the right attitude applies skepticism where it goes and recognizes objectivities where we actually find them. Right? So we're not just skeptical of anything that's not empirical. That is, we apply skepticism where it makes sense. Right? Um, ooh, another spelling error. My apologies. Um, so for instance, if we have reason to be skeptical of our empirical experience, we should be. Right? And we should be skeptical of judgments that are empirically derived if we have reason to doubt them. So for instance, when I say this is a red cup, right? Um, in that instance right um if i was colorblind then i have a right to be skeptical of those sorts of judgments that i might make but just because i'm skeptical with one category of judgments 
doesn't mean I can throw the baby out with the bathwater. It does not mean that I can reject all types of judgments just because they're categorically different, right? He says that actually what we need to do is we need to exclude these obstacles in the form of a natural dogmatic science by making clear to ourselves and vividly keeping in mind only the most universal principle of all principles, which we've already covered, right? The principle of all principles was that if something is presented to us in originarily presentative cognition, then it's legitimated, right? Um, right? So we keep, the, we keep that in mind, the principle of the original right of all data, right? The original right of all data is that the, is the information is legitimate if it, can, it can, if it can be sourced to an original primary form of cognition. Why? Because of the demand that we conform to things themselves. You see how Husserl is sort of working and building up uh, this sort of nice symbiotic sort of set of reflections. Okay, and that was on section 41. Okay, um, and we're going to stop now. This video is now an hour long, so we're going to stop here. In the next video, we'll be taking a look at part two, and we'll be looking at the considerations that are fundamental to phenomenology. So at this point, we're sort of done looking at sort of um, the, pro the naturalistic misconceptions and sort of some of the groundwork categories, genus and species and all that sort of stuff. In the next video, we'll actually start to do and look at phenomenology as phenomenology and start to do phenomenology proper. So thank you once again for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful. Again, I encourage you to check out, read the book yourself, of course, especially if you're in my class. Um, but also I encourage you to check out some of the other books that are helpful. Another book that's also helpful here is, this is a um, Matheson Russell's book, a Husserl, A Guide for the Perplexed. It's also a helpful book in explaining and interpreting uh, various aspects of Husserl's philosophy. So I encourage you to check out secondary source material. It frequently will help you understand. These, these writers are great and they often do a really good job of explaining this stuff. So hopefully this video has been helpful and use it to help further your own research and understanding of phenomenology. Thank you very much and I'll see you guys online next time.